APIs do make your network simple. Just go with me on this for a minute, John. It's, I say this, and people are probably instantly watching, go, Jeff, stop, hang on. But I find it so fascinating because we're here in the DevNet zone, I've said this on many videos, we're in the DevNet zone, that's what we do here. We're trying to help everyone see what the art of the possible actually is. In your role, I'm sure you encounter that sort of conversation yes. a lot. Absolutely. How would, so from your perspective, and really Meraki's perspective, mm -hmm. why is it that we have invested so heavily on APIs in general, mm -hmm. in Meraki in specific, but mm -hmm. why has Meraki really doubled down on the API first idea mm -hmm. of delivering mm -hmm. this platform? Mm -hmm. Well, it comes to, it's a design philosophy around software, really, right? Um, if you are building products, API first, it means that you're building them with documentation, right? It means you're building them with an API contract. You're building the features in such a way that you're committed to backwards compatibility, right? Open documentation, right? And even if we weren't publishing any of the APIs and just using it internally, right? It's a better business practice. So it's selfishly, we have those reasons, right? But when it comes to the customers, right? These APIs and the documentation for those, right? It's really critical to delivering the business outcomes because no single Cisco product is an island and no Cisco portfolio is an island unto itself, right? We're constantly finding new opportunities to partner with other, uh, with our ecosystem developers, uh, other developers that we're adding into our ecosystem. And the only way that they can predictably and effectively integrate is via APIs, right? right? So when we find opportunities and there are no APIs for that feature, right? Then that is fundamentally limiting, right? And when we find opportunities for customers, right? Where uh, we are in the running, right? And there's a competitive deal, but we are able to integrate with their ServiceNow connection or mm -hmm. uh, their Splunk connection or uh, any of the other services, business services that they're using, SolarWinds, right? Well, that gives us an advantage, right? Because we can fit in natively to that story, right? And if the other vendors are not, for example, delivering uh, on those promises, right? They don't have uh, the API throughput or they don't have the API features in general, right? Then they're not able to really fit into a holistic vision of managing the network, right? Because right? ultimately, the point of the network, as much as I love the hardware, as much as I love the technology, I mean, I'm a network engineer first, and then an en and then a software engineer second, right? right? Um, but the, the the whole like the whole purpose of this is for the business outcome, right? Yes. And it's super super critical for us to be thinking about, you know, what is the right way to serve the customer, and it's not necessarily sell this box. It's it's to check. And it's to check feature boxes, sure, but it's really about, uh, it's a little bit less about, you know, do you have, uh, do you have the most uh, compelling single point solution? Or can you tell the best story about a holistic integration with the entire business? You are touching on, okay, so much there I want to unpack, but you are touching on one of my favorite topics. It's a high level topic, but I think it allows us to get really deep into a variety of things for Meraki especially, is, the idea that as a network architect, a network engineer, whatever title du jour you like to ident self-identify as, um, I'm, you know, I started working in my first company as a CTNA, doing network engineering, yeah. pulling cables. Like, absolutely. I empathize oh, my, oh, absolutely. Oh, I, like a hot attic in August? Are okay. you kidding me? Absolutely. Fun, fun story, walking out of a data center one day when I had to rewire all of the uh, fiber cables for our, our SAN, and I couldn't see for two days because all, uh, all the cables were bright orange, so my retinas were burned for like two days, so they, problems we used to deal with. The point of reason I bring this up is, as a network engineer, our, we, uh, many people don't see it this way, but it's, it's a whole mindset shift of your value to the company you work for is not that your finger ops are better than somebody else's. You can type faster that command right. line. You know all these commands. It's not that. It's that you understand that that's a tool that you have. An API is a tool. The software that I have is a tool. And how do I solve, solve the big problems that my organization has with these tools that I have. And so I think it would be really great to touch a bit more on how is it that Meraki is evolving its APIs and why it spends so much time on things like developing webhooks and investing Absolutely. in that to really help network engineers right. and the people in our industry solve those complex problems that are that can be artificially limited when we stick within certain interfaces like right. just a key, CLI or just a GUI, right. et cetera. Right, well that's so uh, at Cisco Life Melbourne, actually I did a, a presentation about how API is the new CLI, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the concept here is that uh, we're talking about a programmatic interface, right, fundamentally, right? API is a uh, term du jour, uh, really, of the past 10 years, right? Mostly in the cloud space, but um, if you're familiar with the CLI, you understand that there's different tools for the job, right? Mm -hmm. You've got SNMP, uh, you've got the classical CLI, 
Uh, you've got NetFlow, right? You've got these other, Syslog, right? You've got these yes. other tools. These are all in a sense APIs, right? Um, and they, you know, if you were looking at, oh, I want to measure like the poor up down status and is something changing, right? Then some of those options are going to be better than others, right? Well, the same concept's going to apply to all of the uh, APIs that we're shipping, right? So we've got our location services API, which is doing the client triangulation in, in real space. Um, our dashboard API, which is the uh, general purpose uh, configuration and monitoring API. Um, and webhooks are increasingly a big part of this story because uh, if you have a solution and it doesn't scale, then you don't really have a solution, right? So uh, when we're talking about massive, massive data sets, like really, really massive data sets, then uh, you can approach the, the challenge of uh, delivering customer outcomes in two different ways, right? On the one hand, you can uh, deliver a like bulk data egress solution and then hand it to the customers and hand it to the data partners, uh, the, the sales partners and, and whoever, right? And say, go forth and, and make sense of this data. Look, we've given you all this data. Look at all these data points and, and good luck, right? Um, now some customers and some partners can really do amazing things with that, to be clear. Um, but when we think about what's solving you know, the biggest problems for the most folks uh, and what really scales the best, right? Well, we have an opportunity with the data that we have about our customer networks to really look deeply into it, like using uh, machine learning models to do deep statistics on uh, identifying insights and trends, right? Now this is work that some of our, again, customers and partners are mature enough to go into and do on their own, and we welcome them to do that. Uh, but increasingly, customers are looking for us to deliver those insights directly, right? So webhooks are a big part of that because when we think about a, let's talk about just uh, appliance capacity planning, right? So your SD-WAN appliance uh, has some number of VPN tunnels that it's managing and you're wondering, okay, how, what is the throughput of this? And uh, you know, when am I going to need to upgrade my MX, right? Well, this is a fair question that virtually every customer at some point is going to have, have to answer, right? Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, right, you can uh, shove a ton of data about like everything that's happening with the MX at the customer, right? Or you can take a more efficient approach, right? Analyze the usage over time, identify those trends, and then potentially alert the customer, hey, we've noticed this trend, right? You've got maybe this amount of time before you probably are going to need to upgrade your MX. You just need the extra hardware for this site, right? Or, on the other hand, and this is a really important one, uh, where are those opportunities to maybe uh, you know, reduce cost? For example, where are you uh, underutilizing your uh, cellular uplinks, right? Maybe, you have, maybe you're paying for uh, a gigabit connection somewhere, um, but it's an enterprise connection, so mm -hmm. it's not cheap, right? It's not the like $50 a month you know, fiber connections we can get at home in some cases, right? Um, and so there's this kind of expectation, right, from customers of, you know, show me my applications. I want them to be all green, right? I want them to be all, all blue, right? They should be in good, good shape. Then show me that, uh, then show me the uh, uh, SD-WAN appliances doing a ton of work, mm -hmm. right? Like delivering on the promises that they have. And then show me the underlying uh, most expensive part of the infrastructure often, uh, the bandwidth, right? And show me that that is being really, really well utilized, right? And this might be a little uh, counterintuitive, right? Because you might think, oh, you want it green all around, right? Um, but no, in fact, the, uh, customers want to know that they're actually getting something for their money, mm -hmm. right? And they want to know that they're not spending more than they have to. Um, so all of these things, right? There's so many hundreds of thousands of millions of data points that like go into this sort of capacity planning and understanding the network. Um, we have a lot of opportunities to focus on the point pieces of information that really are relevant, right? And so as an example, bit of a segue, but as an example, when we think about device connectivity history, right? So this is your Meraki devices. Um, are they connected to the cloud? Like, can you actually manage them? Um, we call this availability specifically, right? And in some places you've seen status or connectivity. We, we're using availability as a term that's a little more specific, right? It's meant to say from the perspective of the dashboard, how interactable is the device, right? Because the device might be online, right, in the sense mm -hmm. that it's up and it's powered on, and you know, LAN devices are connected, but maybe your WAN went down, and so the cloud can't manage it, right? Well, uh, this is a sort of information that customers would be uh, polling usually very frequently, right? Like every five minutes, every, every two minutes, like is it up, is it up, is it up, is it up? This is a lot of work, right? It's not that hard to do in, the, in a sense, but it's work that your application has to do constantly. You have to maintain that. Um, and we, we thought, okay, when you look at a visualization of that, right, a ton of green bars where most of the network should be up most of the time, that's a lot of a sea of green, and maybe there was just one device that had a little blip, right? Now you've got a needle in a haystack problem, right? How do you distill that single piece of information into a coherent and efficient story so the customer can, and the, whether it's a developer or uh, the end customer pointing and clicking in the interface, 
visualize the most important pieces of information, right? And so one of the transformations that I'm really excited about with the, uh, the way that we handle APIs in Meraki um, is look at the most relevant data points, right? Can we start from a position of presuming that uh, the normal operation of the network is good, right? Like, is, is that a safe assumption? Well, in most cases it is, right? Day two, day three, yeah, most VPN tunnels should be up most of the time, right? So if that is kind of the given, right, then how can we show effectively the stuff that's having an issue, right? Well, if you just talk about, for example, VPN outages, right, or uh, blips in the connectivity, you don't have to go into all the detail about all these other ones are good. You can just say, yeah, if we don't tell you that those things are good, they're good, right? This enables us to do a lot of a lot of inference with a very, very small amount of information, right? So when we think about something that's coming in a beta uh, for the Meraki APIs, we're talking about that availability history for devices. And availability history is this concept that over the course of time, devices come online, they go offline, mm -hmm. they might go dormant for a while, um, they might be alerting and then there's different reasons for them to be alerting. And if you are trying to diagnose an issue, you probably don't know uh, in real time that it's happening, you probably find out an hour or two later, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe even longer. And so you have this need to go back, right? Yeah. I, you know what's interesting is you're, as you're saying that, I, the, the theme that I'm picking up on, and it's a very nuanced theme, the theme that I'm picking up on is it's essentially data-driven decision-making. We, so much time is thought about when it comes to administering your networked environment on our devices operating. Are they up? Are they down? You know, this very reactive way of looking right. at what we do. What you're describing is, that's still there, and it's the underpinning of what we do. However, what's much more beneficial, by and large, is do we have the right data to make the right kinds of decisions for us? And that isn't always, is this one thing up and down right, right. now? It's, at, as you said, availability. Afterwards, look back and say, what did we learn from this that we can make a decision about what we want to do in the future? Because right. you can always deal with an incident in the moment, but having that information going forward so you can make better decisions about what your organization's going to do overall, mm -hmm. that's really what you're looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's important for us to know that there are huge data sets that can be relevant, right? But it's really our responsibility to uh, enable the business outcomes for the customer. And so availability history is just one example of this, right? You don't need to know and be polling constantly, like is it up, is it up? You don't need someone looking at the dashboard constantly, right? Uh, to be, you know, to be able to act on these things, right? That you can subscribe to notifications, we can send those things. And sending them via webhooks is an excellent way to actually integrate it into, again, your other business applications, right? You've got Splunk, you've got ServiceNow, we have a ServiceNow service graph connector, right? Which will automatically create incidents in ServiceNow based on real-time events happening in Meraki's mm -hmm. dashboard, right? So there's a direct connection there, uh, and then you can automatically triage that, you know, go through your ServiceNow workflows, whatever that IT remediation looks like, right? And that direct connection, we actually found, blew up adoption of our webhook solution, yeah. right? Uh, we, went, uh, we went to the uh, drawing board about, I want to say, 18 months ago, right? And we said, we love webhooks, but we have a couple pain points, right? One of which is we've got this proprietary format, and this is a consistent problem with webhooks across vendors, right? Some vendors say, we support webhooks, but it doesn't mean the same thing for everyone, right? right. A, webhook, a webhook vendor, whether they're consuming or sending, usually has their own specific format, mm -hmm. right? That they say, this is the way we're gonna structure the data. Now, if you're the collector, you need to adapt to that and have some sort of way of parsing it, right? Mm -hmm. What we found was this was already a deal breaker, right? Because no two systems have the same template, unfortunately, right? And no two systems necessarily provide the same data. So looking at this problem, we thought, okay, we can identify potentially strategic ecosystem partners where we can go and build the, you know, the template for them and say, you know, there's a drop down, you can choose, you know, Slack or whoever, and then you know, over time we'll have a, a ton of solutions and then hopefully it covers mm -hmm. you know, everything that we need. We thought, yeah, we we could do that. We could do that. But it would be a lot more fun and a lot more effective for the long tail of solutions, which may or may not be in our ecosystem, if we had a customizable template system. So you could tell us what format you want the data in, right? It could be an arbitrary format, it doesn't matter. Like, you have the ability to tell us, based on whatever tool you're using, what format that data should be in, and then we will send the right alerts in that format per your configuration. You know what, I, I think this is like probably the the best way to put a pin in, in this particular conversation is everything you just said really reinforces a different conversation that I had earlier today um, about how, how important it is that Meraki is a platform. 
yes, there are solutions you can just go use out of the box. Absolutely. But everything you just described, and specifically that approach to templatizing the webhooks, really reinforces that yes, you can do whatever you want, but we're giving you the control to incorporate your the solution to your unique problem. Absolutely. We're empowering you to do that rather than telling you. I'm giving you the three choices and you pick which one you think close is the closest approximation. I'm giving you the ability to, to build the thing and I'm gonna help you make, make Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and, and I think one of the most exciting parts has been the community reaction to this, has been open source contributions to a GitHub repository of these templates, enabling these, these yeah. other integrations that may or may not be part of our ecosystem. So there's a lot of stuff off the shelf you can download and get started with these custom templates today. You don't even have to develop it yourself. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. It's of course. really good to get into this. Of course, thank, thank you. you, thank you.